This week on the Ritual Misery podcast, we're hanging out with Ryan Airy from Screen Crush. <laughs> yeah, we are. That's me. Hello and welcome to the Ritual Misery Podcast, episode 277 for Sunday, the 28th of February, 2021. This is a show where two lifelong friends and their guests celebrate all things geek. I'm Amos, that's Kent, and as soon as I figure out my damn scene here, we'll bring in Ryan Ari. Ryan Ari, Ryan Ari, damn it! (laughs) (laughs) Oh man, you messed that up like seven times already. Uh, Welcome to the show, Ryan. Hey guys, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. If I see Ryan Ari, I'll tell him you say hello. <laughs> Happy to be on the show. That that Fantastic. would be appreciated. Uh, we've been trying to reach uh, Ryan Ari for right yeah for like ever. So uh, I don't. You're right. You're right. You were asking the wrong name. <laughs> I'm so I'm so bad at this. Like you, you figure seven years in, Kent, I'd be able to figure out guest names. That's. I don't know. No, 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 no. You haven't gotten it right in seven years. I don't expect it to start now. <laughs> so, <laughs> facts. Um, man, facts. I, uh, I, I had an amazing thing happen. Uh, so, you know how I've, I've been using the Legends Ultimate Arcade um, here at the house for going on a year now, and yeah. I did a pre-order for the Legends Pinball that just came out a few months ago, yep. and. Uh, I was supposed to get a, a shipping notification uh, to let me know when it was on its way. I never got that email, but I got a um, uh, knock on the door two days ago, and it was my pinball machine. So um, got that all set up, and we had a little arcade party last night, just just uh, me, Steph, and the boys. And um, it's a blast, dude. Like, as much fun as I had with the arcade machine, pinball is probably even more fun it yeah. is That's fantastic awesome. that is um, such a good i get excited when we get our, our like new scrubbing sponges in the mail and you're ordering pinball machines that's incredible <laughs> yeah hell yeah and and the legends pinball is awesome because it, well it's a virtual pinball machine right and yeah. it's got it's got 22 built-in tables with the option to add more as you go oh and um, it is it is a blast. It no. is a a very accurate representation of pinball. Of course, I mean it's not you know it's not you don't have the physical parts right. Yeah. But as yeah, close yeah. of a of an emulation as possible, it's got force feedback, so you actually feel like the bumpers and all that sort of stuff. Um, it's got accelerometers in it, so that you can physically nudge the table, and it actually performs the nudge like you would with a physical machine. Which means um, it also has very tilt protection. <laughs> yeah yeah um but no it i mean it is it, it's a wonderful emulation it looks beautiful it's it's 1080p um it's uh it sounds great it looks great it is it is an absolute blast now now ken Congrats. i have i have a problem with this okay i'm looking at the show notes and you sent me a picture of it but you didn't put the picture in the show notes so i can't I, I share re- it like what is what you <laughs> come on, man! Yeah. I thought we were team. Uh, all right, I I will remedy that. <laughs> what what uh, what have you what have you had going on, Amos? Um, man. Okay, okay. So it is no secret to any listener of this show or anybody that knows me personally, except apparently my mom, that I have been a lifelong sufferer of. Oh well, I don't say suffer. Suffer is the wrong word. I have been dealing with various levels and various incarnations of depression. My entire life. Right, um, right. It got worse towards the end of my military career, partially due to uh, n- atypical PTSD and a few other things. And very often I find something that that speaks to me kind of. Like, you know, a, a speech or a poem or, you know, there's a lot of inspirational speakers on YouTube, things like that, that will, will kind of trigger a little bit of, man, that's something I need to embrace. I found a video on YouTube. I actually found it on YouTube on a TikTok. They quoted part of it, and I was like, "Man, I need to hear all of this." Went out and found it. Found out that it was actually misattributed on TikTok. Totally different story, right? But I found the original, and I'll share mm-hmm. the uh, the link in the in the show notes and in chat. And basically, this is Adam Roa. You are who you've been looking for, and 
I wish I could say that if you've ever been depressed or suffered depression or gone through a depressive spell, you should listen to this. That would be wrong. You <laughs> should listen to this regardless of your history or affliction with, mm. uh, with, with depression. It is absolutely astounding. It's nothing groundbreaking. There's no new science or anything. Just the perspective of it. And it's written from a first-person perspective based on an actual mm. event that happened in Adam Rowe's life. And it's only five minutes long. It is a poem, very loose poem. So a lot of the stanzas will rhyme. Some of them are just completely out there. Um, it, it's, a, it's a modern poetry is what I like to call it. And it is just remarkable. And I, uh, from, from start to finish, the entire thing was like, reminded me I really need to change the way I think about myself, the world around me, and the people that I deal with on a regular basis. And it's it's really astounding. It's just it's so, so hmm. good. Okay. Good recommendation. That's fantastic. Um, yeah. Ryan, uh what have you had going on lately other than making screen crush videos? Well the, besides screen crush videos, unfortunately very little. Trying to get caught up on doing rewatches of like Star Trek The Next Generation and Batman the Animated Series and just trying to get mm. caught up on other shows like Fargo. Um, but you know what I did this morning? I watched I, I did not prepare to talk about this, but since you shared that and thank you for your service, by the way, Anthony. Um, I watched a video this morning on YouTube that was a half hour long and it was uh, like in the the narrated and like illustrated lifespan of the universe starting right now right this is my dog doug <laughs> <laughs> there he is from the end of Hello, the doug. videos there he yes. is he's being a good puppy i'm gonna put him down because he messes with the cat she doesn't like that and we'll have a war so this video right it's a half hour long <laughs> and it starts off like you know going through time on earth and like in 10 years this will happen 100 years this will happen like super volcano eruptions things like that but it's exponential so time starts going faster and faster and faster to the point where like Earth's, you know, our sun expands. And, but basically like there's a point where it starts to get to like, and at this point, you know, the very last amount of life will exist in the universe. And I'm looking down, I'm like, wait a minute, I'm only five minutes into this video. And then this graphic came up that said the amount of time when like life can exist in the universe, the way we know it and understand it is like, if you were to li comparing the lifespan of the universe is like emerging from the womb. Like that's how little the window is for life to even begin. And we already know life's impossible to exist in space and the conditions to make human beings, you know, exist are like very rare and narrow. So like, then it goes on through like tr trillions times tr trillions times trillions of years. And I watched the slow decay of the universe this morning and I felt great after. Cause it's just, it's like that thing. And uh, what Dr. Manhattan talks about in Watchmen, like we're a thermodynamic miracle. You know, you watch something like that and you get the perspective of it and you're like, it's really hard for me to be annoyed that the 7-Eleven's out of my favorite Snickers bar. You know, like, when you consider <laughs> right. how lucky you are to be, like, taking breath into your lungs. Like, right. how this puppy won't leave this crochet thing alone behind me. I'm very grateful for that. Come here. <laughs> Come here. <laughs> yeah, That's what yeah, I did that, I, mean, that, I, I watched that really, the universe die. <laughs> that really puts things in perspective. I mean, on its, on its face, it sounds like that would be, like depressing but no yeah. i mean it's it's actually encouraging to know that none uh, of, yeah none yeah. of us will be there for it yeah right i we're I, all on a tiny rock in the middle of infinite space so have have you guys had the question i'm, I'm sure you, you have especially ryan um of if you could go back 10 years what would you change uh, about my life just just what would you change just in in general you know you can talk about your career about your life about anything i would have started making uh, youtube videos for myself doing the same thing instead of like doing them for years later doing them for a company like i think if i would have started doing the marvel easter egg thing in 2011 uh it would have you know really paid off and i'd be independent and everything right now that i'm not independent i get to do whatever videos i want but uh, that would be like a you know, if I knew then what I know now professionally, I'd do that. Right. Kent, what about you? Um, I probably would have bought Bitcoin. <laughs> it's a better answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was, I was listening to Cortex on my way back from town this morning or this afternoon. Time, what is time? Um, right. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I, I've had this feeling that. If you could go back and change anything, I wouldn't change anything, 
but I haven't been able to properly explain it. Now, sure, I'm going to butcher it here, too. But once you change one thing, you have to be willing to change every single thing after that. That's true. Right? And, yeah, you know, true. somebody like, well, who, wh- uh, I wish I had that person's wealth or that person's this or, you know, but are you willing to take everything from that person? Like, completely swap because that moment that you're referring to that led to now is also a sum of all the things that happened to them previous and it would literally wipe Mm -hmm. out anything that had happened to you ever and that that thought of regret like it's it's everybody has it you know oh man i i wish i'd done this better i wish i'd but if you're Mm -hmm. satisfied with where you are in life and as we were talking i think last week kent I'm living the best part of my life ever right now. I've got mm-hmm. health issues. I've got mental health issues. I've got, you know, a big move coming up that's going to separate my wife and I for a couple of years as she takes a new assignment. Um, I've got all this, these, but I'm. This is my, this is the best my life has ever been, and I, mm-hmm. I would not be willing to risk even having something better than what I have now changing anything in the past that might not lead me to where I am. And mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. understanding of of uh, the moment, you know, Ryan, you were talking about the video that shows, you know, what, what if you want to live in a thousand years? Well, here's it. it we're kind of at the peak of of at least Earth civilization. You know, we're, we're in that that small window, that blink of time on a universal scale that just happens to collide where the chemistry allows us to interact over uh, electronic means, you know, <laughs> like, like, yeah, just that man, that, this is understanding of the moment this episode perspective. It's <laughs> like, <wow. laughs> well, in my office, I always kept a picture of the blue dot, you know, the Carl Sagan blue dot, mm-hmm. because oh, yeah. it, it's just a way of going like, you know, Hey, don't, it's, it's YouTube videos. It's fine. Like, you know, this is a, <laughs> take a, a an interstellar perspective, you know, Yeah. on who you are. Yeah. That's interesting. You brought up that. It reminded me of something David Sedaris wrote once. He said that um, somebody told him, oh, you're supposed to eat a pie backwards. And when you eat the tip of the pie that you get a wish. And he said, you know, I never knew that. And if I would have known that when I was eight, I would have wished to be a mummy fighter. And then all of my wishes after that would have been like based on that wish. Like I wish for a better whip. I wish for a better control of the mummy language. Right. The point being that wishes kind of lock you in. And I think you're 100% right about what you said. I wouldn't change a thing about where I'm at right now. Yeah, right on. Um, I wonder if you guys would change your answers uh, to the quiz I'm about to give you after, after we... <laughs> you go through it. <laughs> I, I have a feeling we would. Can I please have your attention? In the last 30 minutes, Kent's done something. Now you've got a guess. He was very excited. Kent? Games. Play with him. For today's quiz, I've named it No Country for Nerdy Men. I have a list of 10 countries, fictional countries, and you're going to tell me if it is from Marvel Comics or DC Comics. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Some of these I, are going to be easy. I Some know where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're, we're going to start out pretty pretty basic, um, but um, yeah, like I said, it'll kind of go back and forth. Um, but we're we're going to give our guest, Ryan, the opportunity to choose. Do you want to go first or do you want to go second? I'll go first. You'll go first. Okay. Sure. All right. So this first question is going to be a gimme, uh, basically, or at least I, I hope it is, um, based on your uh, nerdy credentials. Let's, let's not insult right, Ryan, the guest before he's even had a chance to insult himself. I know, I know, I know. I <laughs> know. All right. So your, your first country, Ryan, is this a Marvel country or a DC country? Wakanda. Marvel. Of course. Of course. Super basic. All right, Amos, let's see if you can keep up. This one's not going to be as easy. Of course. (laughs) Melenia. Melenia. That sounds like it comes from uh, the Trump comics. I'm going to say DC. (laughs) You're going to say DC? Yeah. All right. That is a fantastic guest. It is a Latin American country in the DC universe. All right. All right. Starting off pretty well. All right. Ryan, your next Mm country is Rapistan. Rapistan, DC. 
and you are correct. It is a Middle Eastern country bordering Turkey. Mm-hmm. All right. Amos, back over to you. Okay. Latveria. 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 Is that where Latvarian cream comes from? It might be. I think it is. I think it just has some donuts with Latvarian cream. Um, I'm going to go Marvel because I don't think you'd put three DCs in a row. Okay. All right. Um, I'm sure. I'm sure Ryan knows that this is the the home of Doctor Doom. Yes. From Marvel. Mm-hmm. So so far so good, guys. You haven't gotten anything wrong yet. Uh, Ryan, just so, just so you know, he's he always comes up with these quizzes that I have no no idea about. Um, and I basically <laughs> okay. I so, got you. so so it's a battle of uh, of gamification of the game. At least it's fifty fifty. <laughs> So far, <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I and I try to do the either or quizzes as much as possible. Every now and then, I'll do like a "What is the name of the fill in the blank?" Um, it's more fun uh, for the, the people uh, playing at home. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. All right. So, Ryan, over to you. Your next country is Transia. Marvel. You say Marvel, and you are correct, sir. Ah. It is the re- it is known as the Republic of Transia, and it is in Eastern Europe between Romania and Serbia. All right. Where the Maximoffs are from? That's why uh, I think it's not um, familiar. Actually, yes, I think I think you're right. I think you are yeah. right because uh, Sok- Sokovia was was created for right. MCU. So yeah, yeah, I think you are accurate on that. Um, okay, Amos. Themyscira. Themyscira. DC. You are correct. It is also known as Paradise Island, the home of Wonder Woman in the Amazons. Ha! (laughs) (laughs) All right. Uh, Ryan, your next country is Genosha. That's Marvel. That is indeed Marvel. Uh, It is an island located off of uh southeastern africa so it's over by uh that would be madagascar Madagascar. yeah it's it's right yeah it's next to madagascar (laughs) have you guys have Uh, you guys seen like madagascar looks tiny when you look at it compared to africa but if you look at madagascar compared to the u.s it's actually huge it's enormous like it's a massive island it's got a ton of different ecosystems yeah these giant wells of water like pools that like lakes that interconnect underground and stuff madagascar is nuts yeah and it's yeah it's, it's one of those uh, uh northern hemisphere biases that we that we can't carry forward because most right. of the land is in the mm-hmm. northern hemisphere yeah it, it's that's something to look up because madagascar is a massive compared to the tiny island you think is just kind of hanging out hoping to be part of africa like genosha right yeah that's right i'm, I'm not sure how genosha <laughs> scales to uh to madagascar but I'm sure it still scales pretty big to say California. Oh, for sure, for sure. <laughs> All right, Amos, your next country is Zambezi. 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 I'm going to go DC just because I don't think we've had a DC answer uh, since last time I was asked a question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I question your logic, but uh, you um, just like in Baby's Day Out, you found a way to succeed on that one. <laughs> Uh, that is correct. Uh, that is a an, another fictional African country. All right, Ryan, your next yes, country sir. is is it is... a coincidence that there's all these fictional uh, African countries? Because most comics are are ba- are U.S. centric. I mean, from my experience, mm-hmm. most comics are U.S. centric, and the continent. And this is getting geopolitical here, but the continent that we pay least attention to. That's also like massively scaled differently when you look at it on uh on on maps is africa and we just we just don't learn about i I don't know i'm sure there's something there that uh that someone who has far more qualifications than i could really (laughs) dig into and write a paper about just yeah africa eastern europe and central america are usually well in east asia are usually the places where the fictional comic book uh, (laughs) countries are located you know yeah hey buddy yeah, for sure. All right, Ryan, this is actually your final country. Nyazer. 
Niazer. DC. It is DC. That sounded yeah. like, that sounded like pure uh, gamification there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I was totally guessing. I had no, I didn't know that one. <laughs> All right, Amos, uh, this is your final one. Marvel. Kamartage. Kamartage. Marvel. Is that your final answer? Uh, do you know? Uh, do you know anything about Kamartage? No. No, I'm just. I, I'm I'm just guessing because it, it, I think we've had more DC answers than Marvel answers. So. <laughs> All right, so uh, yeah, so this is the um, yes, it is Marvel. It is the um, uh, the uh, Himalayan uh, region uh, where uh, the ancient one, which is uh, Doctor Strange's like mentor, teacher, whatever. That's where the ancient one is from. Gotcha, Kamartage. So I, I, yeah, so this hasn't happened in a very long time. We've got a hundred percent on this quiz. So congratulations, guys. You got the game. Actually, I, I <laughs> guess this one would have been better, huh? Bob, tell him what they've done. You beat the D. Back to you, <laughs> Daniel. All oh, right. Yeah, th thank you, Flavor Toothpaste, for that stinger. So, so the the bit is that uh, Amos, for the longest time on the quizzes, would get sixty percent. So six out of ten questions right. And um, I said that's good enough for a D. And um, then we started making the our, our, uh, our audience the blue, started making the blue that. jokes about uh, gotcha. getting right. the D yeah. and our, well, our, beating uh -huh. the D and uh, uh -huh. the chat so started forth. bringing in there that I was beating the D if I if I got it. So it just kind of went from there. And now we. <laughs> Now we have right. audience supplied stingers because uh, they're awesome. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right, uh, Ryan, uh, you are perhaps best known these days for creating screen crush videos about uh, well-known IPs like Star Wars and MCU and things like that. And uh, I was just curious uh, to, to start out here. Uh, what all goes into the creation of a screen crush video? Is this a solo operation or do you have a, a, a team of folks that help you with research and things like that? Uh, not, uh, yeah, uh, yes and no. So it depends on the video, right? So, um, I have four interns who work for like school credit and a small travel stipend. So I don't really rely on them that much because they're interns and you know, it's a, it's a teaching thing. Like, uh, it's more like they get educational experience out of it so i don't i try not to like rely on them for like work work uh but what's been happening with the mcu easter egg videos is i'll wake up super early 4 a.m watch wandavision watch it again and then this last episode was particularly tough because it had references to specific sitcom episodes so i went back and i found those episodes on cbs all access and on youtube and i watched them to find like little you know parallels that i could use in the video so it took longer to write that one and then I had two interns who were editing it with me. And what we do is we go through the script and we like highlight certain areas. And there's another intern who I'm kind of, he's like a writing apprentice and I'll ask him to do some research for me. But the research will be things like um, go online, see if anybody's posted any Easter eggs on Reddit. Or I always go on my Twitter and say, hey, anybody notice any Easter eggs? And I always credit the people. If it's one I didn't see, I always credit them. So if I'll ask him, like, just keep an eye on my Twitter. Usually people will say really obvious stuff that we've already caught. So lately on those Easter eggs video, Easter egg videos, it has been more of a team thing. It didn't start off that way. Like I did the first few by myself. Um, but I'm just trying to get them done faster, you know? And then other videos, if you watch Screen Crush, you'll see like we do these like immediate takeaways from shows that are out right now. But then we also do these kind of long form videos that are about things that, you know, movies or TV shows from a while back, they're a little more finely crafted. They're not as, you know, rushed out. And those are almost always edited by an intern uh, with like a final, the final touches by me where, and it's, that's, that's like their semester project, you know, like I'll say, okay, so let's do this video. And it's always something that like they have an interest in. Um, and then the editor in chief of Screen Crush is a guy named Matt Singer, huge comic book fan. And he's always, you know, helping me out, like throwing Easter eggs at me that he might have caught that I might have missed. How so? As far as Screen Crush, the 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 brand Screen Crush, how much of that is you? Are you the well, the creative director? Are you like is are you the final 
the final thing or, or is there like a, a team of people that have creative decisions over the things released into the screen crush brand? Um, at first, when I first started doing videos for screen crush, I work at the, I work for the company that owns screen crush and I started off on their team as a video editor. So I worked for different brands, like a, a heavy metal brand, a hip hop brand, double XL Loudwire, just doing, you know, whatever video work needed done, filming things. And I kind of gravitated towards Screen Crush because that's my area of expertise. And I started writing for them. So at first, the editor in chief, Matt, was very involved. You know, he I asked him to approve scripts and he reviewed every video. And thank God he did that because he made me way better at my job. Um, and then just over time, it got to a point where, you know, he didn't have to review the videos anymore because I knew the rules and they'd kind of taken on my voice a good bit. You know, whereas at first I was trying to imitate more his voice and the voice of the site because Matt's also like he's a huge comic book fan, but he's also like a really funny guy. Um, so as far as the brand Screen Crush, I don't do anything with the website. That's all Matt. Um, and he's he's great at that. Occasionally, I'll suggest like a list and we'll do a video on the list or something like that. But as far as the YouTube, that's that's me making all the decisions. I, I, I don't call myself a creative director, but I guess I could have that title. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Um, how um, how involved is Doug in the creation process? Doug actually, <laughs> his primary writer, <laughs> is involved. So frankly, he he's one of those bosses because Doug's the you know he's the assistant manager of the store, which makes him my boss. He's one of those bosses who like always has to have his fingerprints on stuff. You know, like he always has to raise a leg on it, if you know what I mean. Mm. Since he doesn't have <laughs> so you always have to kind of make him think it's his idea. Right. Like instead of covering WandaVision, right? He he's down here. I got him. Okay. Like instead of covering WandaVision, he wanted to cover like the newest season of Law and Order. And he was dead set on us covering that Drew Barrymore talk show. Gotcha. And I had to be like, oh, I think our audience <laughs> might really enjoy uh, you know, other shows, I had to like lead him down the path. You know what I mean? And he's got, God, I shouldn't even be saying this outside the company. He's got the hor most horrible habit of like eating poo, but he brings <laughs> it to the break room in a Tupperware container, yeah. like a little, and he just kind of gets into it. It's not even like poo he finds in the street. He curates it from somewhere. How, how often Don't do you, for how, a dog. how often do you find that Doug like squats on a project and just, just decides it's, it's not, <laughs> oh, it's not going to move no, forward. He'll he raises a leg to everything that comes yeah. through. Yeah. That's... And it's, it's up to me to like kind of scrub it clean of his influence after, if you know what I mean. <laughs> that, yeah. That's for that's instance, amazing. at one point, Doug was like, Hey, you know, the, your mom thing is kind of getting old. Maybe it should be, that's your dad. Or he's like, maybe we should be like, that's John Cusack. And I was like, I don't know, man, John Cusack. That's kind of like an obscure reference. I think we're going to lose people. <laughs> I don't know. He's obsessed with John Cusack. He wants like he he's been pushing this gross point blank script at me for a long time. I'm like, oh, I don't know if we have time, you know. <laughs> I was actually gonna ask you about the about the your mom bit. Um it, it cracks me up every time because you 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 will drop it into a video like at, at the most unexpected moment. And it mm, always thanks. cracks me up. Um <laughs> where where did that come about? Did that just uh, like happen just almost on accident once and then you just decided to keep it or was that a, a conscious thing um no that started uh, oh i mean just ask your mom uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. hey, hey. no that was because um i when we first started doing the mandalorian back like episode one season one our set was brand new i was just in a really good mood and um and i i think like you know kind of what i what i do is it's a little silly it's not a little, it's very silly compared to like the frontline workers and teachers, you know, like it, it, it's a silly profession to have. And especially like doing Star Wars shows and going through and picking out like every little individual species, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun. And I, it's not lost on me how kind of silly it is. So mm. I just thought, oh, I should put something in here where I say like, oh, that's your boyfriend or that's your, you know, I actually went through three different drafts before I got through that's your mom. Somewhere I have those original recordings of <laughs> me trying out different things. So that's how it started. And I didn't, I just thought it was funny. Like the number one rule of like making stuff is you're your own, you're the first audience member. And I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> I just did not think people would like it this much. I thought I, was, I didn't think it would outlast one video. 
I, but then I looked at like the comments and I'm like, your mom was always spiking whenever it, you know. I, uh, I, I didn't realize how much of a thing it was until, you know, cause I, I've, I've seen some screen crush. That's it's kind of the, the type of video that I really like watching. Uh, once I've seen something, I don't like to get spoiled. Or once I've decided I'm not going to watch it, then I'll watch things like that, you know, because that's huh. that's how I am. Um, and I'd seen it a few times, and it, it was always just in passing. And then in preparation for you coming on the show, I kind of crammed like four or five episodes last night. And it suddenly dawned on me, like, this dude's always referencing my mom. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Like, how did I not see this before? And the one that got me was uh, a, a Mandalorian thing. It had like the, the, the cryptic letters, and then you, you spelled out like I, I don't want to get into all these, but at least, at least this one we, we, we'll go ahead and show you. And it was your mom, and I was like, uh, oh, that's an actual. I was bit. really, I was, was really proud of that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah i forgot about that because i actually put the letters up on the screen but i did them in the wrong order yeah. right so like you couldn't yeah, yeah, yeah. that was good was, oh, um, yeah. i, I want to i want to ask you uh, some questions about uh earlier points in your career before you you got with screen crush i noticed something in your resume about working for trojan um is that the condom brand yeah i didn't work for trojan the company so town square media owns a brand called double xl they're a hip-hop magazine so i was part of the video team and still am part of the video team for them the biggest thing that they do all you know throughout the year the thing they're probably best known for is a thing called double xl freshman where they predict you know nine to twelve rappers like young rappers who are like going to be the next big thing it's incredible how often they're right you know there's people who uh kendrick lamar macklemore there's two you know a couple of the older guys but then uh Jeez, I can't even like, I don't know if you guys are into hip hop. I'm not the huge, the biggest hip hop fan, but uh, Kodak Black, 21 Savage, Lil Dicky, like lots of big names. So Trojan sponsored the shoot. So, you know, part of the reason you put Trojan on the resume is because if you're working in video production and you've worked for major brands, that's an indication to a potential employer. Oh yeah, well, shoot. I mean, he's good enough for Red Bull. He's good enough for Trojan. He must be mm. on his stuff, right? Right. Okay. Um, Sorry, that's what, not a better story. I feel like maybe you were hoping I'd be like, I'd have some like crazy condom story <laughs> on that, and I'm just like, oh no, you know, he, he was he was really and, he yeah. was really hoping you were a model, like you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you started saying double XL, and I was like, ooh, this is. Gonna I, go I mean, it it would explain <laughs> it, it would partially explain the score to the game earlier, at least you know. There's <laughs> yeah. Well, I will say this having them as a sponsor meant there were condoms everywhere in the office. Like most offices will have like, Oh, here's a little plate of candy pre COVID. We literally would have like bowls of these rubbers that like, there's just no <laughs> way to get rid of them because they gave us so damn many for the shoot. And also like to display on the br little branded table. And then like for the product shoots after they're just everywhere. Yeah. That, yeah. That'd be a hell of a business they card last, though. They, they lasted a week. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, I think uh yeah, probably a lot of people in the office were being um hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, you never know, dude. You never know. You know, like you know, the one day you don't bring it, it's like what's up is gonna happen, bro. You gotta be prepared. <laughs> bring a bowl of condoms, you never know, bro. Yeah. Yep, yep. Optimism. <laughs> I, I don't right. I don't know that optimism oh. justifies having fourteen of them in your wallet though. So uh, it, it's a balancing <laughs> game. You really gotta <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, all right. So the, the the most interesting thing actually that that stood out to me on your resume, um, and uh, just so people know, I didn't uh, I didn't stalk you. I didn't uh, dumpster dive trying to research you. This was all uh, no. I did readily all available that. things. I, I I did all that. <laughs> yes, That's... Amos was the one dumpster diving. I, yeah. I found I this it, uh, readily on the sounds internet. Sounds like I got a scrub. <laughs> <laughs> you might have to. You might have I to. did not. I thought we uh, were going to talk about Star Wars. <laughs> yeah. So, so Ryan's home address is no. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, no. So you, you mentioned interning earlier, and um, you interned uh, at one time for Good Morning America. Yeah. And uh, you you wrote that you did some research that led to. Um, uh, discovering some fraudulent activity in the Pentagon. I did. And uh, 
I was interested about that because Amos and I are both Air Force veterans, and uh, I'm I'm actually still working for the Air Force as a civilian, and um, I'm always interested in you know like you know Pentagon intrigue and you know things that happen around the Department of Defense. So I was wondering if the, what you could tell us about um, about what was going on with that with that story that you covered. Nothing, nothing. It's kind of like the the condom question. Nothing like as sexy as you're probably hoping. Um, basically, I worked for the consumer unit. It was me and uh, the on-air talent and then two producers. And they were great. I mean, these I, I think I lucked out at GMA. I got like the best department, the best people to work for. So I found that you ever heard of a diploma mill? Yes. Yeah. It's like Trump University. <laughs> no. Yeah. Trump University was a diploma mill. It's basically a, a fake university, not accredited, that will give you a certificate based on your life experience. So if you were somebody who, for instance, had worked in medicine, administration for 30 years and you were up for like a title bump but they can only give it to somebody with a master's you would go to a, a fake diploma pay them a thousand dollars and they give you a piece of paper and, like, yeah, and that people would never check it the problem is people were getting jobs they weren't qualified for including in the government i found a couple of state rep more than a couple a few state representatives a person in fema and the guy who was human resources director in the pentagon which was a senate confirmed job right had a fake diploma from in human resources because that was the job he was up for in the Pentagon. Um, and mm -hmm. he was, you know, confirmed by the Senate by a wide margin. Uh, Susan Collins wouldn't, who spoke out against diploma mills and like introduced legislation against them, defended him, you know, when we contacted her. And he was, you know, he was qualified for the job, except the job actually required a master's degree in human resources. So I found that guy. And they never, I don't think they ever commented or anything. I don't know what happened to his career after. I know like his career was fine, but I don't know if like if he hired like the Blackwater people or anything like that because this was right before, like right after the invasion of Iraq, like right before all that started to happen. Um, mm -hmm. I think I was in touch with the guy who was on air who kind of spearheaded all that. I think he mentioned something about that, but I don't you know don't quote me on that. So, um, so I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm going to take that, which you don't think is a sexy story, and turn it into what I feel is a very sexy question. Um, okay. When you're doing these deep dives into different topics, whether it's, it's the, you know, the shows, uh, Screen Crush is like the easy example, but when you're doing deeper research, like what you did for Good Morning America, like where do you start with that, and how carefully do you have to proceed in order to kind of maintain the integrity of, of what you're researching, but also uh, the scope of trying to find the, all the things. With the GMA piece, I had a very long list of fake schools. So I was able to Google those schools. And a lot of people, like you found my resume, people post their resumes online. It's, you know, very common information. So that's how I found all these different people. And I, you know, had spreadsheets compiled and there were different levels, you know, different ones. There was a really crooked, like uh, so many of them had the same address in, in New Orleans. And mm -hmm. it was under like the Quan Tai Foundation, which then I looked up and I'm like, oh my God, this, like I really opened up a can of worms on all the illegal shit that was going through this one address. So we ended up like trading to get like a guy on camera. We traded that information to a reporter, uh, from a different network, but in, who is a local in New Orleans it's a thing that all these newspaper guys, all the news guys know each other. So that's how I found that one. Um, when it comes to say WandaVision, uh, you know what? I'll, 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 WandaVision, Star Trek, all this different stuff, Star Wars. Some of it I know right off the top of my head. Some of it's really obvious. Some of it's only obvious because before WandaVision, I read almost every comic Wanda and the Vision of Bennett, at least all the major storylines. Um, but when you're doing it, I always write down proper nouns. That that really helps, especially in Star Trek, because Star Trek, like, there's a million aliens in that you know in that franchise, mm -hmm. a million mm -hmm. different locations. So you write down the pronouns and the proper nouns, and you kind of Google those afterwards. You know, where do you want? What's that dog barking? <laughs> Come on, dog. Boy. See what I mean? I can't even do this. <laughs> right? Yeah. Stuff. He's and, always a critic, it seems. Yeah. <laughs> and, and do you? you you give poor Charlie Abel a bad name. <laughs> <laughs> They're bad. Yeah. Do you maintain <laughs> like a, a structured index of all the research that you do so that you don't have to continue to really re-research things? Or is it just like that's the natural flow of your brain to just kind of know 
where to find the information you've found before to confirm? No, I've retained it. That's yeah. all up there. What I do have an index of is uh, when I read the comics, I will take screenshots of ones I think are going to be important. <laughs> and that all goes into like a central folder that like I share with the interns. So when it comes to editing, you know, you might watch, you might notice in the videos, I tend to use the same pictures of like Agatha Harkness and all these other characters. And that's why mm. it saves a lot of time. Cause when I was just sure. like Googling, you know, So yeah, <laughs> yeah. I muted the microphone I, so you couldn't hear what I was saying. <laughs> not, you're not trying to get fired from the convenience store. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I found something on on Twitter today. Uh, somebody was posing the question, um, and I, I'm not sure if it was on your. Uh, I don't know if you responded, Ryan, or not. But I'm going to ask you here anyway. Um, if, if your life was represented in a sitcom, or at least an aspect of your life was represented Ooh. in a sitcom, just like in WandaVision, because uh -huh. uh, obviously like Wanda chose sitcoms that, that uh, she liked, right? Or, or yeah. um, represented some aspect of, of life that she wanted to uh, portray. Uh, what would you choose if your life, like if you had Wanda's uh, you know, power to make sitcoms um, reality, what would you choose for portions of your life uh that's really interesting that's a great question i think of the sitcom i identify with when i was growing up was like growing pains um and and married with children even though they're very different sitcoms but that's mm -hmm. because they both would get kind of surreal and break the fourth wall sometimes you know like there was an episode of growing pains where called i think it was called ben breaks the fourth wall or something where he basically wishes he wasn't a Seaver and then he's not. And it's like this weird, like almost Hitchcock kind of nightmare episode of him trying mm -hmm. to get back to like where he was before. I love that kind of stuff. Like they, there's actually you know, a scary episode for a kid to watch, mm -hmm. but also just the family dynamic. You know, I had a brother and a sister and it was, you know, kind of mirrored that. Um, didn't grow up on Long Island in a really nice house, but there's that. Honest to God, my life was more like Roseanne. Like yeah. if I were going to pick a sitcom that was my life, it was, that's why when I watched Roseanne at the time, the only shows that were on were like Growing Pains and Who's the Boss, where it was like all like people on the East Coast living kind of upper middle class lives. I watched mm -hmm. Roseanne and I was like, oh my God, we fight like that. We can't mm -hmm. pay our mm -hmm. electric bill, you know? Like there was so much in that show that it was like just hilarious because they were able to take like normal, ordinary suffering and find the bright side in it. Um and then later years, man, Malcolm in the Middle was the show mm -hmm. that I just thought that blew me away. I was so glad they used that on WandaVision. But just the use of camera techniques and the storylines and how they just weren't also were like not a nuclear family. Mm -hmm. They, Yeah, fact, absolutely. No, I, I – um, so Roseanne and uh, Married with Children, I, I would probably use those for for my younger life just because, so, you know, the, the realism is is now Married with Children does get a little out there at times. But yeah. just the the rawness of like, you know, people talk like this, people, you know, these things happen. You don't have a perfect house and a perfect life and a perfect family and things like that. Um, just the realism of it. I, I think I relate to more like in my, in my childhood, um, in my adult life, especially the last few years, I would probably use something like parks and recreation, yeah. uh, to, to make fun of like the, you know, government employee type stuff. I, uh -huh. I think would be uh, pretty fitting. What about you, Amos? What, what, uh, what sitcoms do you identify with I in that way? I don't know that I I could think of one that I identify with from my childhood because TV didn't portray my childhood. Like Roseanne might be the closest, but I was an only child. And, you know, mm -hmm. but, but um, adult life, it, it probably feels most like Big Bang Theory uh, huh, because okay. I'm the nerd. I've got the super hot wife, uh, a bunch of <laughs> nerd friends. <laughs> You know, and like uh, that, that'd probably be the one that would, that would most like I, I, I on a regular basis, I say something where my wife has looked at me like, are those real words? You know, <laughs> and it's not that she's not smart. It's just that I'm I, I have a different vocabulary and different way of thinking than she does. And meanwhile, she is the people person. She can she can make you think the lasagna is actually a steak and that you're enjoying the hell out of. <laughs> 
this uh, vegan lasagna. You know, that's the kind of person she is. So I think I think Big Bang Theory might most represent my adult life. I don't know that I could find a a really good uh, connection to a childhood one besides maybe like Punky Brewster or something like that. But then I didn't grow up as in a foster home either. So I don't know if there's a good analog there. Yeah. Um, that's yeah. Well, and I was actually just thinking about this. I don't, I don't know if you guys have seen uh, space force on Netflix. A few episodes. Uh, I, I wasn't in love with it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm kind of like 50, 50 on it myself. I um, still, but, I but still refuse show... to acknowledge that space force exists. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, th- so the, the, Steve Carell comedy is, um, let's say it's loosely based on, on space force. It's in nowhere near in reality what it is. Uh, but just the, what they do with, um, showing, uh, you know, military, uh, interactions, like how, how people actually talk to each other in the military and like government positions and whatnot. It's, they capture that really well. And it, oh, cool. it is something I, I deal with, uh, on a daily basis, especially dealing with like Air Force officers, uh, there's a lot of reality <laughs> baked into all the silly. Oh, they must they the must show. have really good technical advisors then. I think so. Yeah, I like think that so. show. If you look at the roster of that show, that should be the sh- the funniest show on TV. Yeah, like the amount yeah. of talent in the cast and in the writers room. I don't know. I don't find the concept. I think other people will just hear the name Space Force and think that's hilarious, whereas mm. like I hear it and I go. No, that's a you know they they have satellite busters like you give it their own name or not, but that's like a very vital thing that's been around for a long time. And yep, if absolutely. we were to go like it's we I really need that. And then the symbol people are trying to say it's like based off of the Inter- the Federation of Planets or the Starfleet symbol, but that symbol was based off of the original NASA symbol. That you know yep. like so I that's yep. one area where po- politics aside, I'm always up for for criticizing me a politician. <laughs> but like <laughs> i was like that's there's nothing wrong with that it's a stupid name because it says space it's just it should be like extra terran or something like that you know what i mean but like well yeah i mean so really all space force is it, it was uh it was u.s space command like that has been around for a very long time i mean that's who's yeah. in charge of, of putting satellites in space and monitoring yep. activity and uh, a lot of like cyber uh, defense is under space command, things like that. And basically all they did is just restructure it as a, as a separate branch of the military that falls under the air force, which yeah. the air force ran space command anyway. So right. it's really just a renaming and, and they added a, a, a like a, a, a Pentagon office to it. And that's, uh, I mean, honestly, that's, doesn't, is it is not an official branch? It's still under the Air Force, you said. Well, well, it, it is a branch, so it's like the Marine Corps. Yeah, the Marine like Corps the Marine is Corps. its own branch, part but it Navy. belongs to the Navy. Yeah, yeah. Right. so okay. Space Force is its own branch, but it's part of the Department of the Air Force. Yeah. So. Okay, interesting. Yeah. 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 This is so informative. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's it's what we do here, Ritual Misery. Yeah. <laughs> learned a lot about military structure and gaining life yeah. perspective. <laughs> right. Um, right. Right. This is wonderful. How I I to get back to Screen Crush a little bit. Uh, how yeah. how quick can you turn out what you consider a good episode and what is your ideal time like if you could pause time and work on it for this amount of time how long would you work on a, an average topical episode oh that's a great question that's the, and those parts of that are great um there's other channels that'll put them out slower there's other channels that put them out faster um i'm always like trying to get them out faster Last week or Friday, I had the internet problems. It was horrible. Like it was twelve thirty when I finished at midnight when I finished work. Um, I would, I mean, I would like to have as much time as possible. I would like to really go in and like craft all the theories and make sure that every single frame fit perfectly. So, I mean, if I had forty eight hours at least, I would like to do that. Um, it's even a hassle to put in moving images instead of still frames. And another problem is right now, because of COVID, we're not in the studio as much. So I don't, you know, the whole point I was originally on camera was because it's easier. You can just cut away to the host. If you can't find the B-roll, it's it cut at any time in half. Um, if I, yeah, if I could have 20, 48 hours, I would love that. I can get it done fast. I could, I could do a WandaVision and breakdown. Like I could go grab a microphone, improvise. Hold on a second. Where's that toy? Give me that toy. I could grab a microphone. I could 
improvise, just go off my list of stuff and kind of ramble and then put still frames in and have the video up like that. But I, that's not what people are expecting, right? you know? And I, I could do a reaction video, I guess. I've never been a fan of watching reaction videos. I know they get hits. Uh, maybe I should do that. Maybe I'm missing out on that opportunity, but I prefer kind of the way that I'm doing it right now. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've, I've every week, every week, every week I'm impressed at the speed that you put those out at, at the quality, like, cause it looks like something that, that you've been working on for several days and usually you oh. have them out within 24 hours. And, uh, thanks man. Yeah. It's very impressive. I sometimes I'll get screeners of a show. Uh, WandaVision, we only got the first three. Ah, oh, I didn't even realize you you got screeners. That's that's interesting. Well, okay. because of uh, the website and Matt Sanger being a you know New York film critic and stuff, so we're very lucky in that. Uh, but not very often. Like I don't expect we'll get screeners of Falcon the Winter Soldier um, or most shows. Snyder Cut. I don't think we'll get screeners of that, especially if they look at my Twitter. They're <laughs> 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 gonna be like, <laughs> we want to get this guy special access, right? Now, yeah. it, it, that brings me up to, to my final question. Um, how much of you, because Kent and I have discussed before, no matter what form of art you're doing, there's a performance that you're placing and then a person that you are. And the two mm -hmm. may commingle, but they're never, the Venn diagram is never a circle. For you, mm -hmm. how much of what you put into, you know, in, into Screen Crush is performance versus you know how much of it is just you being you oh most of it's me being me the only time it's not is uh it's it's usually better when you're doing a breakdown like a trailer breakdown or an easter egg breakdown to uh people didn't click on that because they want you to criticize the movie you know and it's not like i'll give you an example rise of skywalker i did a video breaking down easter eggs i did another video explaining pot plot holes in the movie I hate Rise of Skywalker. Like, I hate it. I, I hate it. Uh, I can't even think of a good metaphor for this, right? I hate it like Anakin hates sand, right? I hate that. <laughs> so, if, but if you watch the Easter egg video and that things, the uh, plot holes explain, plot holes explain, I think I let it slip a couple times. Like, I guess, like, I guess this is a, like a way to explain this stupid Easter egg. But um, then I did other videos that were editorializing about it. You know, there's one where I like have a conversation with a puppet of J.J. Abrams about the flaws of the movie. So that's that's about the only time when you're not like seeing me, you know, and obviously like I, I leave politics and out of the stuff. Usually like I try to because like, that's not, no one cares what I think, you know, like they care what I have to say about Star Wars and not who to vote for. No one's ever going to go to me and be like, mm, you know, how do you feel about the IMF? Like, is that, is NATO obsolete? Like no one's asking the star Wars Marvel guy, those questions. So that I leave all that stuff out. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we, we've talked a lot about screen crush. Um, is, is that the, uh, the primary place that you would like people to, to find you, um, to, to see what you do it would be screencrush.com or the youtube channel or where else would you like to direct um, folks? screencrush.com great news and list and feature website highly recommend that um i don't usually contribute to that except through the videos so if you want to see my stuff go on the youtube channel and then i'm always um you know wax and poetic on twitter at ryan ari at ryan ari yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right yeah the imposter out there that uh has a different pronunciation, but the same spelling of your name. <laughs> and every now uh, and then, every now and then, I'll post photos of this guy. <laughs> yep, <being> Doug. <laughs> he, he is not oh, happy. Dog. We've had your attention for as long as we have, so we will. Uh, we, we 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 will let you go. And thank you very much for 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 hanging out with us for the hour. And uh, of course, we will uh, we'll let you know when this episode goes goes live. Um, any yep. any final words before you hit the hang up button and we feel sad. <laughs> just just thank you this has been really great i really enjoyed the talk guys yeah thanks for hanging out with us this is this has been yeah. a blast i've been wanting to get you on for a while and it it finally worked out for us and uh yeah really appreciate your time the, the time zone confusion before and just you know thanks both of you for your service and i hope we get to do this again oh when the dog's right. quiet oh right. <laughs> any, any any time open invite anytime you want to come back and just uh uh shoot the shit about whatever you're doing or what you're not doing i mean that's whatever I yeah it. absolutely absolutely all right. right i'll see you later right all right ryan thanks bye-bye
<clears throat> All right, man. All right. That that was that was awesome. Uh, and Ryan, we got him we... out on time. Like how fucking incredible is that? Dude, we <laughs> we got on the Skype call on time. We got him he had a hard out on the hour. We got him out of here. Um, speaking of getting out of here, it's about time to wrap this whole thing up. Uh, yeah. Ritualmisery.com is a great place to see all of the other things we've got going on. Uh, plus swag, plus Twitter, plus, uh, plus, plus all the things. It's all the things. <laughs> all the things. <laughs> uh, we are live on Twitch uh, on Sundays. We're still trying to nail down exactly uh, when we go live. We, we were uh, 4 p.m. Pacific today. Yep. Um... We'll have discussions on if that's going to be uh, our you, you know what time you know what you know, a, 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 uh, podcast at ritualmisery dot com. Let us know what time in in Pacific time between two and six works best for you. And because yep. Kent and I are kind yep. of fluid on Sunday afternoons, which is the whole point of doing the show on Sunday afternoons. It's our most fluid yep. time. So let us know mm-hmm. podcast at ritualmisery dot com. Let us know what time you would be able to hang out for an hour every week and we will uh we'll see what responses we get and we'll we'll go from there absolutely um this is a rm underscore del noche on twitter if you want to yell at me about something anthonylemos.com if you want to yell at me about something uh thank you for listening for kent for you for ryan and for me this has been your ritual misery podcast see ya Where, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? There it is. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this broker. <laughs> R A T U A L M I S E Y. Right on. That was that was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was.